Good evening. Welcome to our November Botanical Society of Scotland lecture. I'm Jill Thompson, the president of the Botanical Society. And I'm very pleased to welcome tonight Nenya Milne, who's going to give us the talk on weeding out the work, plant inspirations for permaculture. But before she starts, just a couple of uh, notices. This meeting is being recorded and it will be available to be looked at in a few days if you don't manage to stay for the whole session or you can share the link to other people who weren't able to come tonight. And you will see that the chat function is um, disabled for participants and um, you won't be able to put anything in the chat. But you can ask questions at any time by typing them into the question and answer panel and at the end of the lecture, we can go through your questions and I'll facilitate that by asking any of your questions. So remember, we have another lecture in December on the 16th, which is Scotland's Rainforests. So I hope you'll join us for that one too. Um, please check the Botanical Society website for notices because uh, we hope next year to be able to do face-to-face -face meetings and not just on Zoom. So keep up to date by looking at the Facebook page and the Botanical website. So a little introduction to Nenya. She uh, did her PhD at St Andrews in a completely different subject because it was all about returning culture to peace building, contesting the liberal peace in Sierra Leone. So this is a big departure from when she did her PhD. Nenya is a permaculture designer, teacher and gardener, and she has various courses. So you can look her up and attend some of her courses. They look very interesting. Her particular interests include edible forest gardening and unusual edible perennials, whether homegrown or wild foraged. She loves walking in wild places, cycling, mushrooming, knitting and minimalist music. So a lot of interests. And Nenya lives in South Edinburgh with her husband and son. So here go, you go, Nenya. Um, I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'll get cracking. Um, as we may know, cats are extremely skilled at getting somebody to feed them. But that's nothing on what plants can do. Plants photosynthesize in the sunlight, that much we all know, and take the sugars down to their roots. It is less known perhaps that the excess sugars end up in the rhizosphere as root exudates. These attract bacteria and fungi who feast on this food, immobilizing the nutrients in their bodies and multiply until they catch the attention of their predators. Protozoa, predatory nematodes and microarthropods move in to eat the fungi and bacteria and return the nutrients to the soil with their excreta. And these are sucked up by the plants. What may be surprising is how fast this cycle operates. According to Dr. Elaine Ingham of the Soil Food Web, it can happen in about the same time that it takes us to open a tin of cat food. Furthermore, plants can calibrate the exudates to attract just the kind of fungi and bacteria that will bring it the nutrients that it needs this very minute. Fungi and bacteria are better at obtaining nutrition from the soil minerals and organic matter than plant roots. So it makes perfect sense for the plant to outsource this tiresome mining to organisms which also do home delivery. Plants don't grow in isolation. Monocultures are rare in nature usually being a symptom of compromised ecosystem. Mostly diversity is the norm. Plant communities and associated microbes, animals and fungi are all linked by this soil food web so that the product of one organism or indeed the organism itself is a food source for another. Some people have figured out how to interact with the soil food web before we even knew about its existence. In spring of 1944, Ruth Stout despaired to wait for the itinerant ploughman, and rather than digging by hand, she sowed her seeds into unprepared ground, covering them up with whatever organic matter was to hand. She was rewarded with a bumper crop, 
and spent the remaining 35 years of her long life refining her technique of deep mulching crops. This she termed no work gardening. In a video made when she was in her 90s, she explained what she meant by this method requiring very little work. I grow all the vegetables for two people all the year round, she said, freeze the surplus, tend to my flower beds, do my cooking and all my housework and answer an awful lot of mail. And I never do any of it after 11 o'clock in the morning. With permanent mulch covering the ground, there is no need to water, weed or dig. The only work is sowing and harvesting. And even harvesting can be made a lot easier with this method. All I needed to do to get to my tatties was push aside the hay, whereas my friend who uh, planted this control plot there using traditional methods, you see the black uh, ground there, spent quite a while chasing down the potatoes. The Sanoba Fukuoka discovered that one can do similar things with farm scale cultivation. His epiphany started when he saw a plant of rice growing happily by the roadside without anyone tending to it. Why, he pondered, can't we grow all our food this way? And so he developed his natural farming techniques throughout the late 30s and 40s. The tenets of his approach are no-till and returning any crop residue to the soil to compost in situ, prevent erosion, feed the soil organisms, and so replenish fertility. Where possible, permanent cover crops of nitrogen fixers like clover are used as living mulch. And then two or more crops can be grown in the same field each year. Otherwise, rotation is a good way to support a diversity of microbes. Mechanical cultivation only comes in during harvesting. Otherwise, there's no plowing, no irrigating, no fertilizing, no weeding. Spraying against pests is also unnecessary because they tend to stay away from good healthy crops. From the late 70s, Fukuoka spent a lot of time abroad lecturing, educating farmers and revegetating desertifying lands while still managing to produce 90 tons of um, citrus fruit a year on his small hillside farm. No work and plenty of food. You'd have thought that this have caught, would, would have caught on, but it seems we're a bit slow on the uptake and often work against the advantages of free natural fertility. Most commercial crops are grown in a monoculture, which removes the support of those plant communities and most animals that go with them. As a result, when pests arrive, they spread unchecked because there's nothing to support their predators between pest incursions. Mechanized agriculture also removes people from contact with their food crops. A report comparing small and large scale farms in 2011 concluded that small is successful. And this has certainly been the case with Tom Nahar organic gardens in Comrie Croft. Small size allows for attention to detail, for timely interventions to deal with any problems as they arise and increased efficiency in using the space. The lesson learned from plants and cats is to interact with those who feed you and mechanized monoculture is as aloof as can be. Machinery may appear labor saving and it certainly has its uses, but the question we might ask is whether the tasks that we delegate to the machines are necessary in the first place. As it is, we're using thousands of horsepowers to effectively exterminate the helpful microbial communities. Tilling breaks up the hyphae, excess oxygen floods the lower soil layers, rapidly burning off organic matter and leading to a collapse of bacterial colonies. Fertilizer salts dehydrate the bodies of organisms from bacteria to earthworms. Vehicles compact the soil, impairing the movement of water, air and nutrients, which finishes off the remaining aerobic microbes. Soils that have lost their fungal and bacterial glues that hold particles together become very prone to erosion. Then we spray pests and weeds, which are pioneer plants thriving on disturbance. And the effect of those poisons is rarely limited to the species that they target. 
This is a huge amount of energy expended on tasks that can be done for us by the very organisms which our industry destroys. And what are the gains in terms of food quality? As farmers choose higher yielding varieties of everything from wheat to broccoli in the attempt to offset the rising costs of chemicals, the nutritional value of crops has been diluting over the past 70 years, but not so the residues of chemicals in our food. These were just some of the concerns which caught the attention of Bill Mollison and his student David Holmgren in the, nine, in the, late, in the late 1970s in Australia when they developed the concept of permaculture as permanent agriculture. Their premise was that it should be possible to design food systems that are productive, regenerative rather than destructive, and largely look after themselves if we model them on how things are organized in nature. Because food systems are deeply entwined with the social, cultural, and economic domain, domains, permaculture soon expanded to include permanent culture. Permanent referring not to immutability, but to truly sustainable foundations of society in balance with the environment. Applications for permaculture design are broad and varied, spanning natural, social, and economic spheres. What they have in common is a reliance on a core set of ethics and principles. Permaculture insights come from observing nature and from a deep respect for the earth and all living beings, including ourselves. Hence the ethics of earth care, people care and fair shares. These techniques, these ethics um, are not unique to permaculture. Their origins lie in the beliefs and practices of a number of traditional societies, particularly noted for their longevity. But permaculture is possibly unique among approaches to ecological design in that it has this explicit ethical core. Fair shares is sometimes presented as future care, which invokes forward thinking self-regulation, setting limits to consumption and ultimately also population growth. In nature, Self-regulation usually happens on the system level with organisms keeping each other in check. And this mechanisms, mechanism guards against ecosystem collapse, which would endanger all species. By factoring this voluntary self-regulation into our approach to design, we can hope to abandon the hubris of a species that has placed itself above natural regulation, which also may yet help us avoid the disastrous consequences of a situation when the ecosystem takes this regulation up on our behalf. There are a number of permaculture principles, an ever expanding set with the subsequent generations of designers adding their own. I'll be introducing some, some of the original principles formulated by Bill Mollison, since they have most bearing on nature inspired design. One such principle is everything gardens or modifies its environment to suit itself. This can be set, seen in the behavior of animals and plants alike, from beavers creating their own habitat and rabbits keeping the sword short for tender grass and predator detection, to fungi acidifying soil to favor those tree partners which prefer their nitrogen in the form of ammonium rather than nitrate. One ecosystem which lends itself to easy imitation is woodland. Hence, growing systems inspired by the multi-story and multi-species woodland ecology, such as agroforestry and edible forest gardening. The premise is simple, substituting edible and otherwise useful species and cultivars for the wild ones. And because this doesn't depart very far from the natural ecosystem of a woodland, this network of beneficial relationships, which supports it, is largely intact helping to nourish our food plants. And because in the temperate zone and many others, most land, when left to its own devices, eventually reverts to woodland, forest gardening is the path of least resistance. It needs minimal energy input to maintain the landscape. In the temperate zone, the documented practice of forest gardening dates back to the 1970s when Robert Hart found that traditional growing methods at his small holding in Shropshire were getting a bit too much for him, while a mixed planting of perennial vegetables and herbs 
thrived was next to no intervention. From there, he developed his method of forest gardening with food crops and other useful species grown in seven layers, upper and lower canopy, shrub layer, herbaceous perennials, ground cover crops, climbers, and the rhizosphere, the edible tubers and roots. Onto this can be added animals such as bees, chickens, or ducks, mushroom cultivation, etc. Hart's mantle has been taken up by others who developed forest gardening approach further, reacquainting us with the concept of perennial crops. Like no dig or no till, forest gardening is not a permaculture invention, but yet another technique which permaculture recognized as being consistent with its principles and ethics to be used in design, not as a blueprint suitable for all occasions, but when appropriate to site conditions, climate, and the requirements of people that it supports. In this instance, the principle involved is stacking and small scale intensive systems. Stacking elements in space utilizes the normally underused vertical dimension. Stacking can also work in time if you combine in one space several perennial crops, which grows, grow most intensively during different seasons, for example, rhubarb and ramses. You can also stack functions or jobs, such as there are in a forest garden, since many weeds are edible, like fat hen, chickweed, hairy bittercress, weeding can effectively become harvesting. Small intensive systems refer to using the smallest possible patch of land to meet our needs so that people can withdraw from the rest, leaving it to regenerate and rewild. And by combining a number of useful yields in one space, the overall yield per area will be higher than if you try to grow all those crops as separate monocultures. Another principle is each important function is supported by many elements. Food being pretty important, there is endless scope for healthy redundancy there, especially if it benefits other species too. Perennial vegetables require very little effort beyond establishment, and they easily increase the diversity of species and with it, the resilience of a garden ecosystem. A principle often used in establishing a forest garden is accelerating succession. Since many forest gardens are started on grass or scrub or arable land, something that is very early in the successional stage here, um, it would normally take over 20 years to move on to the woodland ecosystem. This can be accelerated through deep mulching with organic matter, no-till and other techniques which contribute to more fungally dominated soils typical of mature woodland. What makes a forest garden robust and abundant is not the hard work of the gardener, but its various living elements which are linked into a network of beneficial connections, simply through doing what they do, feeding, breeding, sheltering, and serving food for other organisms. But what, permaculture designers pondered, if non-living elements could also be linked in similar ways based on what each particular element needs, what it produces, and it in its intrinsic properties. That way you can design largely self-sustaining systems which include both living and non-living elements. For example, a home, at least here in Scotland, needs heat. It also radiates heat, especially if poorly insulated. But this heat can be used by something else that would benefit from it, like a plant that particularly enjoys a warm sheltered spot. You can further enhance this by attaching a lean-to greenhouse to the south-facing wall of your house, which will trap escaping heat and also warm the house during daylight hours and slow heat loss from the house during the night. Sun, when it shines, can provide a lot of heat, too much in the summer months. So buildings could be designed so as to capture the solar radiation when the sun is low and deflect it in the summer months when there's too much of it, when the sun is high. Earth also provides heat. It's around 10 Celsius um, throughout the year at five foot down. And this can be used for heating buildings when the temperature above ground is lower. In summer, 
This difference can be used for cooling instead. Most of you will know about ground source heat pumps. Earthships use this property directly by being half buried into the ground. And this design also uses the high thermal mass of the earth for temperature regulation inside the building. Effluent from the house grain black water will be warm. And if you are not using that heat to preheat the incoming water using one of these ingenious uh, devices, you can direct outflow pipes through a greenhouse, which will benefit from this heat in the cold season. Grey water itself, as long as it's free from destructive chemicals, can be used to water the garden, making use both of the water itself and the dissolved nutrients in it. Water for the house can be collected from the roof and stored until required. High thermal mass also makes water a good temperature balancer, which can be useful if the storage tank is located in a greenhouse. Slower temperature fluctuations mean less plant stress and greater yields. Elevating water storage allows for gravity feeding it to its destination, so you don't have to lug it around. Sun can preheat the water entering the house. Solar thermal panels may be familiar, but there are other possible designs. Different building materials with a range of useful intrinsic properties can be used for the walls, floors, stoves, roofs, etc. Wood is breathable and renewable. Stone is durable, has high thermal mass and is less prone to any moisture damage. But less known are such materials as straw bale and hempcrete or hemp lime. Both provide excellent insulation and breathability and hempcrete is also incredibly lightweight. It's as easy to mold as concrete and hemp can be homegrown and carbon negative. The greenhouse that got mentioned a few times can be used to grow tender crops, tomatoes, peppers, peaches, nectarines, but also to extend the growing season and to raise seedlings for the veg garden. It can also be used to house chicken or other fowl whose body heat will raise the night temperatures and the CO2 that they breathe out will boost plant growth. Chicken manure can speed up the composting process, which will return the nutrients to the plants sooner. In winter, hot composting can also take place within the greenhouse and serve as an additional heat source. Hot composting can be designed to incorporate water heating. The simplest form uh, for that is just to bury the lens of pipe in the hot pile. Compost can easily reach temperatures of 60 um, Celsius and above with some effort, like turning, aeration, and the right mix of materials. But achieving 30 to 40 degrees Celsius is very straight, straightforward with a simple insulated bin. Chickens, of course, are also a source of food. Eggs, occasionally meat. They can provide pest control services and help you turn the compost by seeking out any vegetable remains. You can use their intrinsic scratching behavior to clear land for cultivation by confining them to a movable pen, which then is moved around. It's called a chicken tractor. Reflective properties of water can be used to maximize the light getting into the buildings through the darker months, a welcome boon, in summer, deciduous trees can screen the building from this excess heat and light, instead using the light to ripen, to, to ripen the fruit. And the pond can provide shelter for amphibians, who offer pest control services for the garden. But also the land underwater is not lost to cultivation. In fact, aquatic food systems can be more productive than land, both in terms of vegetable matter and protein. Now, this kind of element analysis is the first step for linking elements functionally in your design. And it's best to choose those elements that can perform several different useful functions. A tree, for instance, can be a source of food, fuel, timber. It can mitigate climatic conditions by slowing wind, transpiring water, serve as frost protection. It's an agent of fertility on many different levels. It can perform as a flood prevention measure and it offers habitat for countless species. 
you may notice that products of many elements, like heat from the gray water, um, will normally be just lost. But in permaculture design, the aim is to put any energy through as many useful stages as possible before allowing it to leave the system. Waste in a permaculture system is, view, is viewed as an unused resource. An unused resource can conversely become a pollutant which would require work and energy to remove. And this is unfortunately the usual fate of our own manure flushed away as a pollutant to be treated elsewhere with additional inputs of chemicals and energy. Instead, it can be considered a valuable resource with functions beyond its obvious use as nutrition for, nutrition for plants and soil microbes. Animal manures, including our own, speed up and heat up the composting process and hotter temperatures take care of any parasites, their eggs, as well as many plant pathogens in the compost. Returning finished human manure compost to the garden where you grow food would close this fertility loop. After two years of composting, human manure compost is no different from any other compost. But the more squeamish ones among us don't have to put it on our lettuces, using it instead to fertilize a patch of uh, deep-rooted mineral accumulators such as comfrey, which in turn can be cut and used as nutrient-rich mulch in food growing areas. Thus, a good design would aim to close loops, cycle resources, and maximize useful energy, energy capture while minimizing waste. Relative location is another principle, and this refers to an element's physical placement in relation to others. Some functions can only be performed because of where an element is positioned. For example, a row of trees will only be a windbreak if it goes across the direction of prevailing wind. A pond would only reflect light into the house in the right season if it's the right size and distance from the house, depending on your latitude. A plant propagator placed on the windowsill will only benefit from the free heat from the radiator if it's directed under it. Relative location also helps avoid negative relationships. For, for instance, willow planted on a riverbank will stabilize the bank and mitigate fluctuations of, of water levels, but a willow planted close to a house may wreck its foundations. Where an element's proper function relies on you, relative location helps to minimize the work for yourself. For example, Placing your composter conveniently for both kitchen and your vegetable patch or wherever else you generate material for composting. Some work will be involved in maintaining designs, especially those with, which include non-living systems, as they have little capacity for self-maintenance and regeneration. So if there is an option, living systems will almost always be preferable in a design. For example, using willow rather than stone for flood defenses, encouraging pest predators rather than excluding the pests themselves with nets and, and such like. The permaculture principle here is biological solutions. Mollison famously said that you don't have a slug problem, you have a duck deficiency. Part of this is treating ourselves as biological systems, which is often forgotten in the proposed solutions to food security problems. From a permaculture perspective, nothing that harms us as living systems can be considered sustainable. The choice of elements, their placement and interactions between them in a design will depend on particular circumstances. There is no ideal design, no blueprint. Each design is unique and the scale varies from a window box to large areas of the countryside. What the ideal design scale will be will vary for different things. For example, fruit and vegetable production can have a very small scale, even if their processing, for example, for oil and juice works better on a larger scale from community upwards, depending on the cost and complexity of the equipment. Small scale is perfect for experimenting with, with new and unusual crops while the trial results are obviously best pooled on a higher level from regional to international. But 
can we grow enough food on a small scale? A University of London study published in 1956 found that for the same size of area, urban food production consistently outstripped agricultural production in terms of monetary value of crops. Even despite the fact that the bulk of urban spaces are under buildings, roads, and otherwise unsuitable for growing. If you counted the figures for the actual growing areas, gardens would also outstrip the yields for uh, the fields for yield volumes. Systems for biological water filtration can be relatively small scale too, from individual households to a small settlement. Willow ditches perform this role in a Danish uh, eco village called Freeland. Home scale methane digesters, which are very popular in China, work most economically on a farm or in a group of households rather than just one house. Renewable power generation can also work on a small scale from household to community and upwards. As evidenced by Edinburgh Solar Co op. This is an installation on a school roof in Edinburgh and Harlow Hydro in the Pentlands. In fact, micro hydropower stations are a lot less disruptive for the environment than massive ones which dam entire rivers. Interestingly, scale is also important when it comes to less tangible things like democracy. Christopher Alexander and his colleagues worked out that in a community of more than 10,000, the chances of most people having an effective voice in the local government are slim. So any need that is not met through a design is work that we have to do. And anybody who has spent hours lugging around watering cans during drought will appreciate how much time and effort what a watering can swallow up. Most land-based designs will have a fo focus on water, capturing it during the times of plenty, storing it to make it available later, and designing easy ways to deliver it where it is required. The scale of solution, solutions again varies from a water butt with an overflow which automatically waters containers and replenishes a garden point, pond like here to rehydrating entire landscapes. Sepp Holzer and, uh, has transformed his high altitude farm in the Austrian Alps into an oasis amidst the backdrop of barren looking pine plantations. Holzer's insights too come from observing nature. And he was brave enough to follow those, even when they went against the received expert wisdom. He noticed that leaving long branches on fruit trees unpruned protected the trunks from the deer damage in winter by pooling snow around the trunks. He allowed his livestock to eat toxic plants when they were unwell to medicate themselves. And he learned to breed seemingly incompatible fish species in the same pond by constructed, constructing protected nursery areas for fry with fallen trees. Holzer also, also discovered a way to make semi-permeable ponds by agitating clay in water with the scoop of a digger on a large scale. Also realized that the water cycle in many places has been broken because of the shortage of topsoil capable of slowly absorbing rainwater, which instead gets washed downhill, eroding the remaining soil in the process. Restoring the full water cycle required slowing this water down, with plantings capable of growing soil rich in organic matter fast, nurtured by water from earthworks that plug the most dramatic holes and escape routes to make water collect in lower areas and slowly infiltrate the surrounding ground. The ponds Holzer creates in this way are connected up so that water flows from the higher ones to the lower ones when they overflow and from the lowest ones back into the highest ones uh, when uh, they fill up with the help of a solar powered heat, uh, pump. Only the dams stemming the water flow are impermeable. The semi-permeable pond sides and bottoms allow for the water to flow in and out of the surrounding ground, 
making land capable of supporting more vegetation and returning it to productivity. This project, excuse me, this project in Portugal is one of the many that Holsa has designed in the world using this approach. On his 27 hectare farm in New South Wales, Jeff Lawton also uses a system of swales to catch water when it is abundant, directing the excess into ponds from where it slowly percolates into the surrounding soil, supporting the plants during drought. His Zaytuna farm in Australia has um, fared well through both droughts and floods, which have affected the country in the recent years, with the water saturated land providing an effective barrier to wild uh, fires. Water can also be used in designs as a vehicle for fertility, activating dormant microorganisms and directing organic matter where it can feed them and help them build soils at a fast rate. Key line design developed by B.A. Yeomans in the 1950s, offers a way of building soils fast by reversing the typical batter, pattern of water movement down the slope. Normally, water would drain away from the ridges into the valleys, resulting in ridges that are too dry to support plant life and valleys which might be excessively waterlogged. But with the help of a series of narrow and very deep parallel gashes in the ground made by a special kind of key line plow, water is instead directed back towards the ridges. Organic matter flowing down slope with the water is trapped in the gashes and microbial life flourishes and spreads into the surrounding soil, building topsoil and boosting its ability to support plants. Mark Shepard's highly productive new forest farm is designed for water capture using methods like swales and key line, with lines of trees and shrubs on contour, dividing strips of arable land and pasture. Shepard has used a subsoil plow similar to um, the key line plow to delineate the strips of cultivated land between the lines of trees. This has boosted the fertility and accelerated soil building, where in the first year the plough got continually stuck in heavy clay, in subsequent years it only encountered rich topsoil all the way down. Shepherd's farm feeds the family and generates a good cash income from selling the surplus. They have so much honey that they preserve fruit in it rather than making jam. And Mark's son has been known to complain about being fed farm grown eggs with asparagus yet again. So by creatively using our understanding of nature to design not just sustainable, but restorative systems, people can become part of the solution to a host of ecological problems rather than their cause. In this, permaculture departs from other ecological approaches, which picture any hope of improvement as being contingent on the human species being taken out of the picture altogether. While no system will be entirely work free, with permaculture design, the ratio of effort expended in setting up a system versus its maintenance shifts from 20 to 80% in conventional design to 80 to 20% in permaculture. Most of this initial work, however, involves survey and research into how we can make our systems as self-sustaining as possible. And the actual setup takes about the same amount of effort as in conventional designs. By thinking uh, things through before we jump in, we can save ourselves a lot of tiresome maintenance required by poorly designed systems. Therefore, one area where we shouldn't shun work is acquiring knowledge. And permaculture is information and imagination intensive. And no subject area is automatically beyond its scope. On this note, here are, here are a few links where you can find out more information. Um, for now, this is all from me. And please feel free to send in your questions. Thank you.
No, I've got three lots of unmutings and I've just, this is the third time I'm saying, thank you very much for your talk. I was so keen to, to tell you how wonderful it was. I didn't unmute myself in the right place. But there's so much information there. It's, it's so much to take in um, and lots of things to think about. It was really fascinating. Thanks. So we have, we have a, um, a couple of questions here. Um, with COP26 just over, there's a, we have a lot to learn from this principle, but how can we feed 8 billion people using this? Um, the, most of the things that you showed seem to be relatively small scale. And I wonder how many people could feed with the land area we have available. Mm -hmm. I think there are several questions that you can subdivide this question into. Certainly, you probably can't feed 8 billion people using the techniques that we have currently as mainstream ones for much longer because of the loss of topsoils and many other problems with um, using chemicals on land. Um, answers probably uh, would demand some form of land reform and also one of the social applications of permaculture, which is to design our own li lifestyles um, and life habits, one of which could be shorter working week and with access to land being available in some places, people probably would benefit from growing some of their food themselves. Um, there are other parts to this question. Um, and uh, uh, one of the answers that permaculture offers is to try and slow down the exponential population growth. Um, and that can only be done if we make the conscious decision, if we have enough education to make those sorts of decisions. And if we think things through before jumping in. Yes, yes, that's very important. Um, is, are there any examples of um, permaculture systems that we around Edinburgh that we could visit maybe, or we could, could organize a tour or something? Yes, there are several demonstration sites in Edinburgh mm -hmm. and within short distance of it. Uh, among the links given, um, there is a link to permaculture association project called LAND, or in Scotland, its version Scotland, land being an abbreviation, meaning learning and demonstration uh, network, or the other way, uh, yeah. <laughs> learning and network demonstration. Uh, there is a list of sites that you can visit. There's my own garden where you're all welcome. There's a um, very small suburban garden in Bonnyrig belonging to Darius Namdaran, who is uh, supporting not just plants, but many animals on a very small scale. Uh, there is a new garden being developed in the campus of uh, Napier University in uh, Merkiston, which uh, is available for visits and even hosted some fringe events last summer during the festival. And there are many, many more. So absolutely, yes. OK, well, it would be good to, to organise a, a, uh, a tour to one of those. Uh, Jonathan Silverton comments that uh, childbirth in most of Europe, especially in Scotland, is already well below replacement. So there's a, a difficulty with balancing lower birth rate with uh, the need for land and the need for this kind of uh, agriculture. It, we don't hear much about it, um, permaculture in the literature. I'm just wondering how uh, common a system it is throughout um, the UK and Europe or whether we call it by other names? Uh, it can certainly be called by other names, although rarely so. Uh, sometimes the name permaculture has, has been shunned by some people because uh, strangely it has become associated with the kind of more touchy-feely side of doing things, uh, which is surprising given that um, its origins are in the university environment in Tasmania, Australia. Um, there is, there are both sides to it, um, and it is widely known in certain circles, but it is by no means mainstream, partly because there is no money to be made from doing things sustainably in this way, depending, uh, and if that's, if this is regardless of the scale, whether you're doing it on a farm scale or on a scale of your garden, it's not profitable enough for anybody to make a lot of money out of it. Um, and this is where permaculture also has a role in trying to reform other systems like economics and uh, society. Uh, and there are in fact very many projects that are not land-based, but society-based cultural projects uh, that permaculture has uh, given rise to. Um, 
So a, a lot of the forest gardens I saw in Africa um, follow these principles without uh, with uh, multiple layers of gardens and multiple mixed things and not having monocultures. And so many people in Africa do practice this kind of thing and it's and it is difficult to to transport this. Um, so I've got some nice comments here from Patricia. She says, fascinating, Nenya. Are you available as a consultant for individual gardens? Yes. Okay, that's mm -hmm. good. So they can look you up on your website. Yes, uh, my, uh, my particular interest in design is um, designing low maintenance edible gardens, but uh, I can stretch to other things as well. And there are other consultants if this is not what you're after. Great. Um, and June Bowden said um, she's going to live in France, in Brittany, and she's taken lots of your ideas on board and she's going to make her husband help her oh, um, <laughs> when she goes to Brittany. And so uh, Patricia says thank you, so hopefully she'll get in touch um, and, and let, let you be a consultant. So, so is, there, is there any further questions does anybody have? No, there's not very many people writing in the in things, but we've had a, a good audience tonight. So since we have no other questions, I'd just like to remind people of the talk in December and to look at the website. And if you need to listen to this again, because it was so fascinating um, and so much information, it will be online and be advertised soon if you check the website. And that leaves me just to thank Nenya very much for a very interesting talk. And thank you all of the people uh, who attended tonight. Thank you. And asking questions. Thank you for hosting, and it's been a pleasure. Okay, we'll look forward to meeting you before too long. Good night.